All right. In the spirit of the new internet run by the emperor Elon Musk, I'm taking over the CBC. I'm just doing it now. So we're merging today's episode. It's not the worst of the CBC. It's me doing what the CBC should do because I'm just better at it than they are. Uh, it looks like the CBC watched last week's episode where I watched an entire episode of The National and said, you know what? This is actually news. They didn't do any crazy propaganda today. And I gave them a good They're like, no, 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 what? That's over. Never again. So today it was just, just one, you know, after another, all their greatest hits. So you know what? I'm the CBC now. Everyone sit down. I now get, I get $1.4 billion from the government every year to do this show. Now, I'm just declaring it. I'm taking it over. This is Canada's official internet rambling, anti-CBC, CBC thing. So we're, we're merging. And of course, the CBC's score today on the Rosemary Barton scale is going to be a zero because it's now the Daniel Borton scale, right? I'm, a, I'm in charge. I'm doing the news. So we're going to go through what CBC's nonsense stuff was today. So they started off with Elon Musk buying Twitter, which basically was a bunch of lunatics lighting themselves on fire, acting perplexed by you like, what, what do you do this? He spent $44 billion on Twitter. Twitter isn't even a good company. It's, it's market, it only makes like $3 billion a year. So why would he do this? It's like, because he said why he was doing it, because he sees it as a, a public forum and need for free speech. And then it's like, if free speech isn't even, even good, is it even a good thing? You're journalists. You're literally journalists. You should be free speech absolutists. Now, they're government propagandists, but they call themselves journalists. So, of course, they spoke to an expert, or I'm not sure if they even spoke to an expert. It looks like they just, like, took an American, because it was an American person. It looks like they just kind of clipped in some things, but she was talking about Elon Musk wants to open up, which means all the moderations, and it, he, he's going to bring back trolls and bots and violence. The violence on Twitter is going to increase. Okay. Here's an actual fact for you. The amount of violent assaults that have happened on Twitter are actually zero. Um, over the last year, it's gone up from zero to still zero because it's impossible to do violence on the internet. Look, I'm going to punch you right now. I can't hurt you. I'm on the internet. I'm on your computer or your laptop, or maybe you have a desktop. Maybe you have Windows 98 and you spent like 75 minutes waiting for this video to load so you can watch it. God bless you. Still can't hurt you. You're fine. Ta. Still fine. No violence happens on Twitter. But this is the classic leftist nonsense of words are violence. We're turning words into violence now. So people tweeting mean things. Now, I mean, I think we've all seen the legendary clip by the MSNBC guy who's just like, well, if Elon Musk takes it for Twitter, then they could, you know what? take away candidates from a certain political party, depress you know, the algorithm so people won't even know that they're essentially being shadow banned. We wouldn't know this till after the election. How That's how Twitter works right now. That's why he bought it, because that's currently how Twitter works and it's not going to work anymore. And it's not like I want to see leftists and Democrats and liberals taken off Twitter for disinformation. Like Christopher Freeland, if we're talking about disinformation from governments, Christopher Freeland should be removed. Same with St Stephanie Jabilbliot. Both of them are chronic liars. Justin Trudeau, also a chronic liar. The auto police lying right now. But I believe you have the right to be wrong because who's the arbiter of truth? Blah, 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 blah. All those important implications. But then, then they bring on like in the business experts, CBC's business expert, what is it, Peter Armstrong or whatever. His job is to know nothing about anything and just like act confused. Like, why would he do this on Twitter? You know, he's so eccentric. He has a billion dollars. Like, what are these problems on Twitter? It's literally like the CBC is unaware of anything or anyone existing outside of the CBC headquarters. And one of the problems on Twitter uh, is this kind of perpetuates on Twitter in the blue checkmark community. So there's a feature for those with the blue checkmark that you only get notifications for other people with blue checkmarks, you know, liking your or, or sharing your stuff. So, you know, you get 250,000 followers, let's say that's the ideal one as a media personality. You get the blue checkmark. Now, there are right-wingers who get blue check marks, like Ben Shapiro got blue check marks. You have to get, but as a right-wing personality, you have to get hundreds of thousands, usually, before you can get the blue check mark, at least tens of thousands, right? But for anyone who works at the Washington Post, New York Times, CBC, all of them get blue check marks by, you know, who they work with. So the disproportion of left-wing blue check marks to right-wing is sort of like a university skew. My point to, to all of this is when you have this feature where it only shows you other blue check marks who are liking and sharing your stuff and that's you get exposed to well you're going into the echo chamber which means literally those at the cbc who spend their entire days at cbc headquarters they then go on the internet which is open to all and they only see 
Well, the CBC, they see NBC, they see ABC, they see, you know, global news and CTV. They see the same echo, uh, echo chamber uh, out there on social media. So they don't ever see the real world. They don't ever need to mix with the plebs, the non-blue checkmark people. So this is like another problem where they might legitimately not be aware of any of the gripes or, or grievances of anyone on the other side. Now, I think it's much more likely that they're just ignoring them. Like they're ignoring the fact that Donald Trump was removed from Twitter and completely ignoring the fact that the Ayatollah Khomeini, Khomeini, I can't remember, I can't remember that. Well, the current Ayatollah is allowed to be on Twitter to threaten to nuke the world and kill all the Jews. That's perfectly fine on Twitter right now. Right? But misgender those Jews, and we got a problem with the Ayatollah. You can kill all the Jews, but you can't misgender them. That's the current uh, uh, way it is on Twitter. So that needs to be changed. Right? And, and they're not talking about the fact that, you know, so we could talk about Donald Trump, but the more egregious one is James O'Keefe and Project Veritas being taken off Twitter. They violated none of the terms and services. You know, it's the same thing with like what happened to Andy Lee in Canada. Right, James O'Keefe from Project Veritas, they just did a great job of exposing all these people and got really popular. So the establishment just, oh, if he's going to expose Twitter and Facebook and CNN and, and the Washington Post, well, we'll just remove him. Even though he's won everything in corporate, we'll just remove him and take him away because he's being effective. That's the type of stuff. And that's how Twitter uh, hurts our democracy. So all these people scream, billionaires now own the media. And, you know, to CBC's credit, they did highlight billionaires that own, they did say Jeff Bezos, second most uh, wealthy man in the world, he owns the Washington Post. So they did point that out. And other billionaires who own communications platforms. So they did appropriately point out. Now, again, all the people screaming about billionaires owning the media, none of you said Jack when Disney bought up like 60% of the current media. Like when Disney merged with Fox and ABC and ESPN, like it's all pretty much owned by Disney, but they're pro uh, children transitioning, so it's fine, right? You can own the media as long as you're promoting nine-year-old boys pretending to be nine-year-old girls, you know, hanging out with drag queens and snorting ketamine. That's all cool. That's cool. That's super cool. But, you know, tweets about Bitcoin. No, can't have that. Can't have someone, you know, trolling Bill Gates. That's pretty hilarious. Like I love I love Elon Musk on his like you know he put I think sixty nine point four two zero percent of statistics are made up, you know was, you know they, they did the 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 smear last time on him it was like he says crazy things like maybe he should just set the Tesla stock to permanently at four hundred and twenty dollars. It's obviously a joke. It's a four twenty joke. Is it what billionaires should be doing? Yes, it is. I think it's better that we have billionaires making four twenty jokes than I don't know like meeting uh, on Epstein Island. I'd rather Elon Musk be making jokes about 69420 than on Pedophile Island. Is it just me, or do I think that the real problem with the billionaires are the Pedophile Islands, not them buying Twitter? And oh no, it's owned by a billionaire. It was owned by the Saudi royal family in Blacklock before, uh, no, not Black, uh, Blackrock. Blackrock's good, Blackrock, Blackrock, bad. So like, it just changed the hands of which billionaire? Like this billionaire is pro-free speech. <gasps> oh no, what does he mean by free speech? He means freedom of speech. And like all you friggin' lunatics, on leftists, you're like, well, free speech just means the government can't go in it. You don't have the right to freedom of speech on Twitter. I'm so smart. Huge brain. What a huge brain analysis you have. Yes, no one's saying that you have First Amendment rights on Twitter. We are saying that as an American company, you should respect the ethos of free speech in our culture. We should have a culture of free speech in the West. It's one of the things that makes us great. In Canada, in America, you should be able to say whatever you want within reason. I mean, you can't openly call hate speech nonsense. Like, you should be able to free, freely speak on any political issues. You should be able to give your, your views on vaccines. You should be able to give your views on gender theory. You should be able to give views on critical race theory. And some of you might be wrong. Some of you might be crazy. But that's freedom to discuss in society. Twitter should respect the ethos of free speech. Also, it makes you a difference between a platform and a publisher. Right? If you want Twitter to remove all the people you don't like, like Donald Trump or Mally Tager Green or James O'Keefe and all that, well, great. Well, then you're choosing what content goes out there. So why is Mallory Taylor Green not allowed on Twitter? That's dangerous. But Hamas is allowed to be on Twitter to recruit people to kill all the Jews. This is the double standard. I say, and you got Sean King, you know, the world's most famous white man, um, going on like, Republicans, answer this question clearly. Do you believe in hate speech against Jews? I've seen Sean King engage in hate speech against Jews, but he calls it Zionist. I've seen him be, you know, call, you know, support the genocide of six million Jews under the guise of anti-Zionism. So shut up, Sean King. You're, you're the epitome of white privilege, so sit down and listen to the BIPOCs, okay? 
I have identify as black. I'm a Rachel Zolz. Rachel Zolz is my mother, so I am a BIPOC now. I'm trans transitory to the BIPOCs. All right, so that was first thing. It's just Elon Musk. It, it, panic. Just uh, panic. Right, then there's some Ukraine stuff. Well, well, I mean, I've given you my views on Ukraine. I've done it better. My only thing is I won't talk to you in the friggin' uh, what's-her-face's voice. Oh, the, the, the woman who does the Ukraine stuff for CBC. It's like the dying puppy commercial voice. Like, 8,000 puppies are murdered in the Ukraine. An old lady plays piano as refugees stream in the sights from Kiev. Unfathomable. Just shut up and do the news. It's just so annoying, your voice. So, yeah, you get a Rosemary Barden for how annoying your voice is. You suck, I don't. Ha! All right, moving on from the Ukraine. Next thing is, they cover the fact that the RCMP wanted to charge the Prime Minister for the Aga Khan trip. You know, they actually covered it. Wow, okay, good, you actually covered it. Um, but again, they did the thing of, the only reason they covered it is because the Conservative Party brought it up. So they cover the opposition's criticism of it without really going into depth. Basically, the uh, the prime minister had a had someone finance his own vacation, which any MP would have lost his job for, and the fact that the prime minister retroactively cleared himself of any wrongdoing, which made it okay. That's how he got off of it. The RCMP let him off because the prime minister wrote a letter saying the prime minister's actions were okay. Classic Justin Trudeau. N -n -n nonsense. But that's not the most egregious thing. We're going to move on to another story, which is the Liberals appoint a Liberal judge who donates to the Liberal Party to uh, oversee the Liberals' invocation of the Emergency Act. So a Liberal is appointed a Liberal to look into the Liberals. What do you think they're going to find? So this is, should be a much bigger story, is the fact that a Liberal donor um, and uh, a friend of, of the Liberal Party um, uh, an Ontario PS court judge has been given uh, the reins. He, don't worry, you won't get to see uh, the information, but he'll get to see it. And don't worry, the liberal will look into the liberals and determine if they did anything wrong. Um, now, here are some facts about the invocation of the Emergency Order. Emergency Act, sorry. Uh, the Emergency Act was invoked after the border blockades had been cleared. After. It was only used on uh, the people in Ottawa. A judge had ruled that the protests in Ottawa had been legal. They'd been legal for weeks. So when we talk about removing disinformation and misinformation, I'm sorry, every liberal minister, I mean, the arson hoax, misinformation, the fact that the police still call it an illegal occupation when a judge ruled it to be legal in Ottawa, well, I'm sorry, that's misinformation. It's harming people. People are going to jail. People have their gut property stolen by the government. So if we're talking about Twitter monitoring misinformation, hello, right? So they don't highlight this. They call, again, CBC calls it an illegal occupation who occupied the city, who did this, horns blaring as a sonic assault on the city. What a great line, right? Horns blaring in a sonic assault on the city. Many businesses forced to close by the truckers. Wrong, wrong, wrong lies. I was there on the ground. Businesses were forced to close by the police in the city. It was the government who asked them to close and put pressure on them to close. So the government could do propaganda claiming it was the truckers. It was the government who closed the businesses two years ago, and it was the government who closed the businesses two months ago. The government closed businesses, not the truckers. The truckers supported every single business with the balls to remain open, and they all made money hand over fist. It was their best months. Some of them, you know, made a, as much of the profits they lost of the last two years back just because of the truckers being there for three weeks. The truckers saved businesses that the government destroyed. The government closed businesses. Justin Trudeau, Kim Watson, Doug Ford had an assault on businesses. They closed. They put pressure to close them. The truckers tried to save them. The inverse is being portrayed on the CPC and it is fake news. It's why you're here now. By government mandate, you all have to watch this. By government, I mean me. I'm now mandating, right? You have to get, you know, 10,000, you have to get vaccinated every day with, you know, uh, what's the, I, I don't care. Um, sorry, I don't watch Alex Jones. Alex Jones is vitamin water. You have to drink, you have to put it in a syringe and drink Alex Jones pills or vitamin, or his filter, he has a filter. Yeah, you have to drink the, the filtered water that Alex Jones promotes every day, okay? You have to inject it into you and then watch the show. And the government has to give me $1.4 billion a year. No, wait, they're asking to increase the budget. So you have to increase the budget. This show needs $1.5 billion a day to continue going. 
I, I love, there's going to be some really confused, like, boomer who doesn't get humored. Like, now the National Telegraph and Daniel Boardman, they're owned by the government. They get a billion dollars in funding. He admitted it. Look! Guys, seriously. Get with the program. Or get off the program. Get with this program. You're government mandated. You know, the government of Dantopia. You know what? If Listen, here's my threat. I will send just, if you do not like, subscribe, share this video and like the page, and do whatever you can. If you do not do this, I will send either Justin Trudeau or Jagmeet Singh to your house to lecture you on intersectional feminism for three and a half hours. An entire Lord of the Rings movie. That's true. Maybe four hours. Extended cut. Four hours. If you do not do this, for four hours, Justin Trudeau and or Jagmeet Singh will be at your house teaching you about intersectional feminism in blackface or brownface. Justin Trudeau will be dressed as Jagmeet Singh if he comes. So it will be Jagmeet, but it might be Justin. They'll look like Jagmeet. He will be wearing a turban. He will be brown. It might be Justin. It might be Jagmeet. It's up to you to decide. Now, this is what the liberal government is. So they're appointing a liberal judge to look into the liberals' invocation of the Emergencies Act. And they still... I mean, a lot of it is, you're not going to find the truth, and their problem is judge, if this judge can't conclude that, hey, the blockades were cleared prior to the invocation of the act, um, then he's not trustworthy. And then that would be a great litmus lit lit test. And if he doesn't acknowledge that a judge in Ottawa ruled the auto protest to be there legally, well, then this isn't a, you know, a, a legal thing. And, you know, there are many reasons given. Like, I know people are really focusing on, like, Jeremy Kenzie wants to pretend to be a hero, that his meme country of diagonal on, which... Yes, was stupid. And yes, the liberals did quote it as a significant security threat. But ultimately, all of it was made up. There was, there was a bunch of different fake news stories, right? The arson, fake news. The guns found at Clouts were not at Clouts. They were at a place near Clouts. It was not part of the blockade. So a lot of fake news stories uh, accumulated to create the narrative that the government used to invoke the Emergencies Act. Uh, as the CBC themselves has, to, has, to, has had to retract multiple stories that they did fakely, because they are fake news, about the Freedom Convoy, um, which led to the invocation of the Emergencies Act. But don't worry, the Liberals will investigate the Liberals to find out if the Liberals did anything wrong, and you can just wait there and see if the Independent Commission does its job. So I think we know how that one's going to turn out. Um, another reason uh, I'm just doing the entire thing today, their big focus today was they actually did a, a look into the rising rate of anti-Semitism. I was shocked. Shocked. Now, they did do some good things. So you can tell that they did work with Jewish organizations like B'nai B'rith to sort of do the story. And they weren't openly anti-Semitic while doing a story in anti-Semitism. So that's a huge, huge, huge improvement. So I'll give them credit. Usually when the CBC covers anti-Semitism, they usually throw some anti-Semitism in themselves. Now, they did that in a couple recent, like, you know, recently uh, last week with covering um, what's happening at uh, the Temple Mount, where Hamas is stockpiling weapons, throwing them at Jews, and then they're play just pretending that the Israelis are going in to the Temple Mount to clear them out for no particular reason, and ignoring the fact that there had been terrorist attacks the previous week where dozens of Israelis had died. So they are still promulgating anti-Semitism every other day of the week. But during this one, they're like, rising anti-Semitism? How come? Mirror. But. So the things they did say correct. They did call it an Israel versus Hamas war. So they acknowledged that Hamas, terrorist organization, was fighting Israel. And they did acknowledge that um, people were being attacked that people were going around to Jewish neighborhoods saying anti-Semitic things, promoting anti-Semitic conspiracy theories. Uh, they did acknowledge that it was related to Hamas supporters in Toronto who were beating up Jews. But here's the deal with the anti-Semitism. I'm going to explain it to you right now. You're not going to solve it, mainstream media, until you call it out. With every other type of racism, we want to name and shame and find out who's behind it, right? A white man punches a black guy in the streets. We want to find out who taught him this? What did his parents think? What was the church saying that he went to? Blah, 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 blah. But when it comes to anti-Semitism, we want to pretend we're ignorant and stick our head in the sand. Unless it's a tree of life shooting uh, by a white supremacist, and then we can find out, oh, the Nazis. Anti-Semitism, modern anti-Semitism, well, classically, well, modern, in the, the modern day, comes from three major sources. The far right, so neo-Nazis, who are probably the least dangerous to the Jews right now. Now, individually, they're, they're, they're more dangerous as individuals, but they're smaller, they have no institutional authority, and yes, they can do the tree of life shooting, and yes, they are dangerous, and yes, they are bad, and yes, they exist, 
uh, but they have no institutional power. The problem is the other two major sources of anti-Semitism have massive institutional power as it goes in our modern society. And those are far left activists. So they, York University, York University is a major promulgator of anti-Semitism. You know, um, you know, modern Middle Eastern studies. They don't teach actual uh, Middle Eastern history. They teach Palestinian propaganda. Okay, guys, Palestine doesn't exist as a country, never has. You know, yeah, you want to say, oh, the Palestinians. Sure, the, the Palestinian people were invented in the 1960s by an Egyptian-born terrorist named Yasser Arafat who took the star for the Jordanian flag and claimed the Palestinians are real. And fine, like if you want to, if you want to say like that's where Palestinian history starts, fine. But don't tell me there was ever a country called Palestine before this. Which brings us to number three source of anti-Semitism, which are Islamists. And the Islamists and the leftists are working hand in hand. That's York University. This is Islamist radicals, supported by left-wing morons, academics, to promulgate modern anti-Semitism. So modern anti-Semitic theory dates right back to the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union, where Mahmoud Abbas leader of the PA, has a PhD in Holocaust denial from the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union invented anti-Zionism as a means to undermine the West, because Zionism is just basically Israeli nationalism. There's nothing wrong with nationalism. I'm a Canadian nationalist. I believe Canada should have the right to exist as a sovereign nation that's for the Canadian people, right? But we don't exclude others. You're free to immigrate. You know, all different people are welcome. Zionism. I believe Israel has the right to exist. And the Jewish people have the right to self-determination in their homeland. But Israel has 1.5 million Muslims in the population as equal citizens. Great. They're Israeli Arabs, not Palestinians. Right? Druze. Armenians. Christians. The only place in the Middle East where Christian population is increasing and not decreasing, Israel. Right? This is just nationalism. Israel has the right to exist. But the Soviets invented anti-Zionism, which is just anti-Semitism. No, it's not a perfect overlap. Okay, sure. Anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism are slightly different. If you draw a Venn diagram, there's a 99.5% overlap. But for the 0.5% who are like hardcore crazy libertarians who don't believe in any state, fine. I acknowledge your existence, the three of you out there who are anti-Zionist but not actually anti-Semitic. Good for you. Uh, you, you. You feel seen. But the real problem is the marriage between the, the, the Red-Green Alliance, the marriage between the Islamists and the Communists, the Socialists, the far left, right? Because the far left hates the idea of the nation state. They want to destroy it. So the great way they can focus on is they focused originally on the Jews. The Jews are a canary in this coal mine. And by promulgating anti-Zionism for decades and decades and decades and getting people to adopt it, and people on the hard right not caring about Jews, being like, oh yeah, screw it. Yeah, because you have crazy... Far writers who are like, Zionism is the globalist Zionist. And you're like, globalism and Zionism are two di diametrically opposed ideologies. Like, Cl Klaus Schwab is not a Zionist. George Soros is not a Zionist. George Soros is an anti-Zionist because he hates the nation state. These two ideas, this, the most globalist organization in the world, the United Nations, spends over half of its time messing with Israel, complaining about Israel, because they're not Zionists. They're globalists, diametrically opposed. But because you can yell about Zionists and some people inherently understand, oh, Zionists, they're yelling about Jews, right? You can get some people on the far right to be like, oh, yeah, anti-Zionism, right? And then you can matriculate that type of theory down to academia. And then anti-Zionism gets the theories get accepted in the fake science, like the social sciences. And then they come more into the political sciences, into the other theory. And then you get anti-Americanism, anti-Canada. Canada is a, this is, you get post-colonial theory. Right, which is anti-Canada, anti-America. Everything in the West is evil. Everything not in the West is good. It's stupid, but these are its intellectual roots in the Soviet Union, um, in conjunction with you know former Nazis and Islamists. And the other thing is like you're just never going to address this problem until you actually call out the fact that there is widespread anti-Semitism within the Muslim community. I will give you an example, a personal example of something that uh, you know happened. To, okay. So if you remember last year or a year and a half ago or whatever, most recently there was an incident in France where a teacher was decapitated for teaching about the Charlie Hebdo cartoons in which they were all murdered. So if you remember Charlie Hebdo's magazine, they printed pictures of Muhammad, terrorists came and murdered them all in the name of Islam. A French teacher wanted to teach this subject of the value of free speech in a Western world. Uh, the Muslim community was very upset. There were uh, community centers and mosques where they rallied against this guy. Young Muslim man chopped his head off in the name of Islam. Now, uh, Emmanuel Macron, president of France, took the side that um, decapitating someone is the, the person who got decapitated is the victim, and it had something to do with radical Islam. 
This upset uh, people in Toronto. So there was a big rally um, against Emmanuel Macron um, for his anti-decapitation stance in Toronto. And I went to go film and record it on my Facebook page and, and YouTube. And I, I was covering it. And I was just kind of getting people's opinions there and you know, asking some questions. And I stayed behind after the rally to sort of talk to some people. And there were people there trying to convert me, doing the basic apologetics and talking to me about Islam. And I was, I was you know, people like me. I was being polite and, 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 you know, being friendly. And, you know, I had to go, but they invited me to dinner, which was all very nice. But one of them actually did follow up and said, like, I'd like to engage with you on these issues uh, personally. So I said, yeah, sure. So I, I got his number. We were, you know, texting for a bit. And... Um, you know, long story short, he very nice guy. I, I invited him over to my place to come sit down. We'd have lunch together, and I'd answer questions, and, and we'd sort of talk about the the issues um, that you know um, you know I had, and, and and get to better understand me as like because I was I'm like, yeah I'm a Zionist, so he's like oh okay. So first, when he comes in, he, he very nice guy, and he said like oh if my mom knew that I was going to the house of a Jew, she'd be very upset, and his mom is not Palestinian. So, oh, she was traumatized. No, his mom was Iraqi and his father was Pakistani. So nothing to do with Israel there, okay? They were just from the Arab world. His mom, I'm sure, was a very nice lady. She hated Jews. He told me this. Now, good on him for coming from a, clearly an anti-Semitic household, but meeting me on the street saying, hey, you know what? This, this guy is not that evil, so I will come and, and sit down with a Jewish person. So, you know, we got to talking. Was it the most productive conversation Humanly, yes, you know, philosophically, no. Um, you know, there got one tone to the conversation where he started talking, we talked about, okay, let's get to the, uh, the, the thing of what I want to talk about, which is like free speech, like the cartoon, like chopping someone's head off because Canada, you should have the right to draw pictures of Muhammad. Like I was I'm like, you have the right to, like, I don't think there's anything wrong with drawing Muhammad. Like you might be offended, but the worst thing, you know, the real victim is the people get decapitated. And like, that's, I'm like, our culture is not like, you know, we draw cartoons. It's not a big deal. Like, for example, I gave the uh, the um, Danish cartoons that inspired um, the Salman. Uh, so that that mass murder and and that thing, the, the the OG ones. They weren't discriminatory. Th this was them in their culture saying, "Oh, let's use Muhammad uh, and pictures of him doing Danish things to help integrate the community." Because that's like this isn't in the West. We don't see anything really wrong with this. And he was like, no, 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 every time they draw the picture of Muhammad, it's is Islamophobia. And it's this, and he's saying, like, every time people draw Muhammad, it's purely out of hatred and Islamophobia and the discrimination they face and blah, 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 blah. And I came to him and I said, okay, let's look at the, the, uh, um, the different types of discrimination we face in the world. Okay. Your problem as a community, your community's problem is some people somewhere are drawing cartoons of your prophet. And this hurts you to the point where you're willing to justify decapitation in some way. My problem in the Jewish community is, as you've said, your mother would be upset if you simply talked to a Jew or knew you were at my house. So, like, do you see where the disproportion is in the level of discrimination we face? And again, good on him. And this is the good thing about Canada. He's second generation. He grew up here. He came from an anti-Semitic household and now is more willing to go and meet and talk to a Jew, which is good. This is progress. But we're not going to get over this until we point out the fact that there are mosques in our country where genocidal anti-Semitism is preached. We're not going to get over it until we talk about there's Islamists, far left, and radical right. We're totally on the radical right. The CBC knows neo-Nazis hate Jews. I'm with you. I'm not defending them in any way. There are far right elements out there in Canada. If we go through them, yeah, I'll find there's crazy comments about the Jews. Bad. We'll... But everyone's on board with me. No one, like every right winger I know who's not an alt writer will be like, yes, the alt right is bad. Anti Semitism is bad. I agree. These people are bad. Cross the board. They're bad. Check mark. But then the two other ones are institutional power. Well, the anti Zionist academics who just hate Jews because it's the academically lazy thing to do and they're mediocre at best and they don't have any real skills, so they're just jealous. Right? And then you have the hardcore Islamists uh, who are, you know, Muslim Brotherhood, Hezbo Tahrir, Hezbo Mujahideen, like all the, that type of stuff. They also hate Jews. But you can't criticize, you know, the, the radical Islamists. And you can't even point out that the academics, you know, at York University are driving this. Like you can kind of beat around it and Erling Kotwell is there. But like, why? How could it happen? Call it out. Like, let's, in, like, again. So this, like, relates back to the whole Twitter thing and, and what I've been saying in sort of buying a Twitter. Just personally, this is why I don't take the left seriously. Because I've been there. I've experienced anti-Semitism. Do I think Canada is an anti-Semitic country? No. 
Jews experience the highest rate of hate crimes in our country. Is our country anti-Semitic? No. Is it perfect? Nothing's perfect for anyone, okay? And on Twitter, I see genocidal anti-Semitism all the time. I'm fine with it being on there. I want to be able to see people post it so you can screenshot and say, look what this person is saying, right? The problem is if I, if someone says, and Hamas says, I want to kill all the Jews, and then we as Zionists say, look, this is terrorism. These guys are terrorists. We get removed for hate speech and Islamophobia for calling the terrorists terrorists. Let people speak. I want to be able to expose people for saying these things. I just, I have a dream that we live in a world where I show someone who is to the left of center a video or an article of someone advocating for the genocide of all the Jewish people gouged under some sort of anti-Israel, anti-Zionist stuff, but then says Yahud, 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 and they say, you know what? That's bad. And it's bad that this guy is still seen as a community leader and faces no consequences. Someone should do something. That's the world I want to build. So I do think a, a more open, free speech friendly environment is more conductive to building that world than the overly censorious one run by the Pronouns Club in San Francisco. So thank you everyone for watching. This has been the National Daniel CBC edition. I am the new captain now. I am the CBC and the government and the taxpayer really. You now owe me $1.5 billion. Or, you know, I'll give you a discount. I'm not gonna say, you know what? I'll keep it at the 2020 rates, 1.2 billion. See, I'm saving the tax. You know what? Just a, a cool billion. I've just saved the country $200 million. Instead of paying the CBC, we're going to save $200 million by just giving me a billion dollars every year. Remember to like and subscribe, or I will be sending Jag, Meet Singh, and Justin Trudeau to your house to lecture you on intersectional feminism for four straight hours. And then you will die of an aneurysm.